This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lodger was veiled, the face was yellow, and the valley was fearsome, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder what kind of medical practice Dr. Watson actually ran? Or about the number of Holmes's monographs? Or how much the rent was at 221B Baker Street? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Walder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 266, A Final Illumination on the Luca Code. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you are you ready to be coded? (laughs) I'm ready to be decoded, G coded, bar scanned, fingerprinted. I uh, you can collect all of my my personal information right down to my molecular structure. I'm set to go. Fantastic. Well, we will do that in Italian if we can. Before we do that, though, we will remind people that they can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash trifles266, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com site where you can find anything related to this particular episode, as well as the ability to contact us. We are trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com if you'd like to email us. Or you can, um, oh goodness, you know what, Bert? I just realized we have a phone number that we should share with people. Now, it's the general I hear of Sherlock everywhere phone number, but I won't get into all the the mess, but I had to figure out a phone number because of the way Google has, is structuring the, the uh, accounts now. So, no, 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 no. You've just, you've just just missed this completely you mean to say you were able to engineer with considerable work a significant upgrade to make it easier for people to contact us there you go i love that i love that way of thinking well here it is the phone number in case you're wondering is 518-952-2125 now let me ask you a question scott how on earth is that easier what can i do is there a simple mnemonic i might be able to use to remember that number it's funny you should ask bert why yes there is if you take that number and pick it apart and add a a, you know one of the letters to one of the numbers where you can you know you look at your phone and there's a b c d e f etc here is a great way to remember that number it's five eighteen ninety five two twenty one b five how about that? It's 1895-221B bookended by a five on either end. We've been That's waiting. wonderful. We've been waiting forever for this phone number. <laughs> well, I'm glad we have it. And let's put it to use. If you have a comment, if you have something you'd like to share with us, you can call that number or just speak into your phone. Record an MP3 on your phone and then email it to us at trifles that I hear of Sherlock. Com. We'd like to remind you that we um, also are doing this monthly drawing for all of our Patreon supporters. We just did one in the last episode. We'll do one again at the end of February. So make sure you are signed up to support us and your name will automatically go into that drawing. Well, uh, I alluded to the code, the Luca code. Now, is this... Is this some uh, Italian government regulation, the Luca Code, that we need to be aware of? Some, some maybe FBI code that was uh, in place in the early 1900s? 
Well, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has long had a code established on the admission of Lucas into our food supply. So that when you buy, you know, a freshly wrapped or freshly baked Luca at your local store, you could see that important bit of authority registered or regulated by the Pennsylvania State Department of Agriculture. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Well, in this case, let's try and apply it canonically if we can. The Lucas we are talking about are uh, Gennaro Luca and his wife Amelia, who appeared in the Red Circle. Now, they were communicating to each other in some fashion. Uh, first, uh, Sherlock Holmes found scraps of paper with simple words on them. But then we go on to find that there was a light. Uh, being shown from one window to another. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's a wonderful, this is a wonderful paper, a wonderful topic, a wonderful subject, and a wonderful story because, again, it just shows you the variety of Sherlock Holmes' ability for deduction. Mm -hmm. And it can take even, um, you know, the most trivial affair. I mean, after all, this is a case that comes to Sherlock Holmes because a landlady has, has gathered significant suspicions around the actions of one of her, one of her uh, tenants or residents there. But look what comes from it. But also there are some lessons here, which I think we'll get into briefly when we look at Don Yates' great story, great essay about um, how, what you can take away from this when you want to write your own Sherlock Holmes paper. Yeah, I, and we should probably preface this by saying that this is um, our monthly feature, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the Theorist, where we look back at a piece of old Sherlockian scholarship. In this case, it is a final illumination on the Luca Code, written by Don Yates for the Baker Street Journal in 1956. So this is volume six, number three of the Baker Street Journal from 1956, and it is his paper. Now, Don Yates was a, uh, a professor of, uh, of uh, classics of language. He worked in Spanish and Greek and Latin and French, uh, and he was from uh, the University of Michigan in Lansing, where he formed the Greek Interpreters of Lansing. So he had this paper when he was only 26 years old, published in the BSJ, uh, where he says, I think the time has come to clear up beyond further conjecture the celebrated perplexities long associated with the Luca Code. The reader will recall that this is a system of signals that was employed by the young Italian couple, Gennaro and Emilia Luca, in The Adventure of the Red Circle. Um, a coherent explanation of how Sherlock Holmes was able to intercept and interpret the Luca messages has never before been satisfactorily outlined. The truth of the matter being that prior research into this field of inquiry has unearthed more new questions than it has produced illuminating answers. <laughs> <laughs> so in brief, Bert, can you describe what the Luca, what the code was that the couple was ostensibly using as we come to discover it in the Red Circle? Yes, yes, I can do that briefly. But before I do that, I just want to point out that these first three paragraphs, mm. you know, if you were sitting there, Arlen, I get notes from some of our listeners who have questions about, you know, how exactly does this scholarship thing work? This is sort of an archetypal um, paper, and it's just got a great structure to it. So here is Yates and just in a couple of sentences, bang like Conan Doyle, he gets right to the question we're going to talk today about the complexities associated with the Luca Code. Nobody's done it before satisfactorily there have just been more questions coming and then he says it's complicated but at the end he says hey, you know, I think when we know the true answer here, it will lead to the increased glorification of Sherlock Holmes. And I think that's, you know, these are just really a couple of important elements about the introduction and purpose of papers, particularly written around this time about Sherlock Holmes. Mm. But to your question, what's going on here is that Holmes, I mean, very briefly, Holmes uh, and Watson observe that there are flashes of light coming from the room occupied by this strangely behaving tenant. And Holmes quickly deduces that they must be... Um, 
a code, obviously, and the best thing to do would be to be able to translate those flashes of light into letters of the alphabet, and this he does. And that's where the questions begin. Yes, and and the question, of course, is, you know, the, the, the simple prearranged code. Uh, a is one candle flash, B is two. So you, you go through the alphabet, you know, and, and God help us if uh, the Lucas were trying to exchange any messages with a lot of Zs because <laughs> as you're waiting for 26 flashes, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a sort of Morse code, isn't it? Um, but Morse code is a little more complex because there are three uh, signals used for each letter. That way you're able to shortcut around having to go through 26 flashes for the letter Z and 26 flashes for another letter Z. I mean, God help them if the, the Lucas were trying to refer to the town of Abruzzo. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a key point you're making there because um, it would have been, uh, if you don't know Morse code, it's a challenge for anyone uh, not not to use it, but to perceive it. In other words, am I looking at a dot or am I looking at a dash? That was just a short light, but the next one was really, you know, not all that much longer. And wait a second, was that a pause? Right. Was that a, a dot and then a dash and then a pause? So if you're not familiar with it, and it's one of the reasons why Morse code could not have been used by the Lucas. That's That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But very quickly... Don Yates uh, comes across a, uh, he, he says, uh, one flash comes, A, then 20. That should be a T, says Holmes, who continues to spell out the message, which is then twice repeated. Attenta, A-T-T-E-N-T-A, an Italian word meaning beware. The word is followed by another, pericolo, P-E-R-I-C-O-L-O, -O, danger. And the flashing's interrupted. And the two friends rush to the building, and the solution, of course, is then revealed. Now, Yates writes, The arresting fact now arising out of this episode, which has so puzzled early students of the sacred writings, is this. The Italian alphabet, which Luca presumably was using, has no K. Therefore, the numeration of all the letters below K in the alphabet would be disrupted, since Holmes was obviously receiving the code on the basis of the English alphabet. Luca's message, then, we are told, should have been read by Holmes as, I <laughs> which I will spell for everyone, since you're not reading as we are, A-U-U-E-O-U-A. -U -U -E and the second word being, which is Q-E-S-I-C-P-M-P. -P. <laughs> I don't know why you have trouble with these perfectly normal words. Hello and Quesicobum. I mean, clearly Amelia and Gennaro must have been familiar with this. But no, no, you have gotten, as Don Yates has gotten, right to the point of this. Why are these people flashing in English? And we will get into Don Yates' explanation of that, as well as some further thoughts, because I'm not all that certain it's completely an accurate explanation, but we'll do that after this word from our sponsor. Yes, we're in the middle of one of those Mr. Sherlock Holmes the Theorist episodes of Trifles, where we're looking at a classic piece of Sherlockian scholarship. Well, where can you find classic Sherlockian scholarship? Now, there are a couple of places, and we can think of one of them right off the bat that's available right now. It's The Grand Game, Volume 2, which contains Sherlockian scholarship from a variety of sources, mostly the Baker Street Journal, from 1960 to 2010. Volume 2 is all that's left because Volume 1 was so popular, it sold out. We'll have more news on bringing Volume 1 back from the dead in future episodes. But for now, get on over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and pick up your copy of Volume 2 of The Grand Game, covering the last half century of Sherlockian scholarship. You won't find better work 
in a single volume anywhere else. Go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and get The Grand Game Volume 2 today. And we are back and considering the Luca Code as uh, told to us by Don Yates in the Baker Street Journal in Volume 3 of the 1956, uh, excuse me, Issue 3 of the 1956 volume. So, Bert, you were saying before that uh, here we have this this conundrum, this seeming conundrum. But Don Yates says to us, the, the previous scholars, as they, they pointed out, this inconsistency in the numbering of the Italian alphabet versus the English alphabet. He says this is nonsense. And, and, and how does he actually go on to examine this and help us through this conundrum? Well, he sees, te- as you say, he tees it up quite well. Why is it this guy is signaling to his wife in English? And how could she? Because we know from this other experience in her exchanging one word notes with her landlady that she has little, we presume he deduces, she has little knowledge of English. How could she be able to figure this out? Well, the answer from Don. Yates says, well, think of the purpose here. The purpose is they're hiding from Giorgiano, from black Giorgiano. And that, you know, the feeling that they might have had was it could be even his eyes were at that very moment when they're doing these flashings. Um, the, the Gennaro lay waiting in the gathering dusk. So, he says, their question is, what code could we use said Emilio and Emilia and Gennaro, um, that could not be read by Black Giorgiano. And so they had set up their prearranged code in such a way as to make it virtually impossible to be read by Giorgiano, who, whom we know had been in New York less than the four years the Lucas had been there and whose constant secret society connections probably demanded little or no knowledge of english that's exactly right so so we have a native italian speaker who is who is on the hunt and we have these two italians who have been in uh who have been in uh, america and now in england and are getting by and we know that amelia is familiar enough with the english language to ask for certain items from her landlady by name she she has little slips of paper that she puts out on her tray. Remember, she's never seen. She puts out these little slips of paper. Soap, Daily Gazette, Match. And Match was the thing that clued Holmes in, that there was something a little abnormal here. Because normally, if there were a smoker as a resident of a, a boarding house or as a lodger, Typically, uh, the English-speaking, the native English-speaking individual would ask for matches, not match. And and that's where Holmes understands that there's a little bit of uh, of, of uh, crossover going on between the English and the uh, Italian language, or the English and Italian understanding by the uh, the speaker or the writer. Mm. Well, one of one of that's exactly right, and one of um Don Yates' um, points here um, is the confirmation that Emilia did not have a uh, good knowledge of. English. How could Signora Luca, he says, whose knowledge of English was purportedly slight, have received and understood the warning? And um, what Don Yates says, somewhat controversially, I, con- um, with some controversy, I think, that the factor which uh, incorrect, incorrectly interpreted had led to the early conclusion that Mrs. Warren's rumor was not proficient in English. Um, and he he draw he he points to the what he describes as the, the laconic nature of the notes sent down by Signora Luca with her meal tray, and the substance of these notes is such that Holmes took a look at them and supposed erroneously that the author was unfamiliar with English and was selecting her wants from an English dictionary. 
in Harry. And of course, Yates then goes on to say, this position Holmes deserted after the first few letters of Gennaro Luca's code had been flashed. And he also points out that, you know, by the way, clearly um, the Signora at the conclusion of the adventure was able to speak in a smooth flow of perfect, well-phrased English sentences, proving there, thereby her unquestioned mastery of the language. Hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we come to understand that this arrangement that was made between Gennaro and Amelia Luca was um, there would be there's some combination of English and Italian happening in this code. It wasn't clear that it was one or the other. Spelling Italian in the English alphabet was one way to kind of uh, trip up anyone uh, who was a native speaker of really either language of uh, of following them, um, or at least someone who had no working knowledge of the other language to uh, to follow them, and mm. and and this is this is where uh, you know Don comes to the conclusion um, after Holmes receives these messages from Mrs. Warren and understands that there is an Italian speaker, a non-native English speaker. Um, involved. He says that Holmes carried off the case with honors has been admitted by all quarters. Fresh new laurels, though, I feel should be bestowed on the detective. For although he made no recorded mention of it to anyone, Holmes had analyzed the problem that the situation had presented in extraordinary detail. From only the brief notice of an agreed code between the Lucas placed in the Gazette's agony columns, he was immediately prepared to anticipate a message from Luca based on either the English alphabet or the Italian alphabet. And we didn't know that, though. He says, however, by the third letter of Luca's message, he knew the alphabet was to be English. The Italian alphabet version of Holmes, without a doubt, had had simultaneously figured in his head up to A U U. We get to that <laughs> second U in a row, and Holmes immediately realized that, oh well, this isn't this isn't uh, the the English alphabet, and so he dropped it. And for this reason, Watson was completely unaware of these brilliant, fine-geared, analytical machinations of Holmes's mind. And therefore, he was unfortunately unable to communicate to that, them to us in his account of the Red Circle. Yes, yeah, beautifully said. And I think, I think Don is really right on that point. I mean, we haven't paid enough attention to Holmes' ability to be thinking in Italian, his knowledge of the Italian language, because we know, among other things, that he's impersonated an Italian clergyman at least once in the past, and he did do work for His Holiness the Pope. Um, so we can presume he had a knowledge of Italian. So I don't think we have paid enough attention to Holmes' ability to say, wait a second, this isn't an Italian, this is an English, and that just missed Watson completely. The only place I would quibble with Don Yates is that in, is, is in Emilia Luca's ability with English, it's more than likely that Watson cleaned up um, her narration, um, you know, particularly because of the um, extraordinary quality uh, and consistency between Watson's own use of words and the words that, that are being used by Amelia Luca. But beyond that, um, you know, Don Yates' point is there would have been an agreed-upon list. Well, why would there not have been? I mean, regardless of her ability to speak English, it's a different thing to be reading and writing in English. And, of course, she didn't want to be heard as a woman with an Italian accent in Mrs. Warren's room. But why would they not have had an agreed-upon list of six or seven words useful to Amelia Luca in English, like water, soap, towel, matches, pillow, danger? And by the way, you know, Amelia, hey, pedicolo is danger. And when you type, you know, when I type to you, beware, that's attenta. You know, you could just as easily have done that, and and it doesn't necessarily mean she had any great facility with English. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation, Bert, because you think of the time that it would have taken to flash out 
Pedicolo. Uh, <laughs> um, you're probably talking about something that would have taken three minutes or so to fully comprehend. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't they have had a, a, an initially agreed upon code that was five, five quick flashes in succession means pedicolo? I mean, yeah, if yeah. you're trying to warn someone that danger is imminent, you don't take three minutes to flash out. <laughs> pair, P-E-R-I-C-O-L-O. -O. You, you come up with the shorthand code, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they hadn't thought that through. But then again, there would be no case for us to comment upon if that well, were not so. I guess that's so. But you think about all the time that it took Emilia and Gennaro to exchange all of this information by flashes and how long it took Emilia to write her, her words soap and water and towel on a piece of paper. And you think about how long it's taken us to record this. And this is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Senor Luca, you must give me the signal. Go away. I don't trust you. I trust no one but my husband.